Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown. As always, I am joined with our first and to date only Ward 7 candidate who has taken their time out of their busy schedule to sit down with us, Miss Marilyn North Pagan. Marilyn, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much, Chris, for inviting me. And I'm glad we finally got to meet. I know it's been a bit since that return of the messages, but it's been a busy summer and I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much. Well, I appreciate it. Marilyn, uh, if anyone has listened to this show before, they know what the first question out of the gate is going to be. You are no exception to that, the question. Where does your sense of duty to serve come from? Well, when I graduated high school, um, in order to leave a, a very dysfunctional community, I was given the opportunity to leave to serve in the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, and I took that opportunity. And where that actually took me was to CFB St. Jean, where I did my basic training. And leaving a small community that was just all my people and growing up there and going to a province like Quebec was a very difficult um, time for me. I, 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 I felt very isolated, but um, I did find family within the Canadian forces. And during that time, I, was, I, I didn't really know what intergenerational trauma was. And I had a break from, from my, my parents. You know, my, my grandparents are residential school. My parents are 60 scoop. So that bond was broken a long time ago. So what I was able to find within the Canadian forces was a reestablishment of what that bond actually was. So these people I served with side by side became my family for the duration of my service there. They taught me everything that my parents could not teach me or did not have the skills to teach me. And when I, when I left, I left with, a, a, with the teachings that I received from the military, which is I served under the Canadian flag for all Canadians. And I, and I stand to, to do that with, with honor. And it doesn't matter what portion or where you come from on Turtle Island, if you call this valley your home, your treaty too. And I really acknowledge that because I served for everybody. And I, I did that with honor. And as I'm, I'm reminded every November 11th and every day after that, this is an oath I took for the rest of my life. And not too many of us have done that. And I'm very proud of that. Um, I've had the pleasure to read your website, learn a little bit about you, because I know in the hectic world that we live in right now, some people can't take the time to do that. So I want to talk about your background a little bit, uh, if you don't mind. Um, you, you talked about your military service. Uh, I, I appreciate the duty and service that you gave to our country. I, I, I believe that uh, anyone who puts the uniform on is uh, above me and will always stand above me shoulder to shoulder. So I thank you for that. But I want to talk a little bit about service because in 2021, you have decided to do another line of service and that is the political service. Uh, you've decided to throw your hat in the ring for uh, Calgary City Council for Ward 7. Why now? What is it in 2021 did Marilyn think to herself and say, I believe that I am the right person to help lead Calgary to the future and also forward in the recovery from what has been going on in Calgary for the last 10 years? Well, I'm going to tell you, I think Calgarians uh, threw this at me first before I even believed that I was capable of doing something like this. Um, currently, our leadership, our municipal government does not reflect what our community looks like, and we are missing voices at that table. Um, I took an appointment in 2017 with the Calgary Police Commission, and before that, I sat on the committee that actually produced the White Goose Flying Report. But up to this point, what, what changed was I was recruited into a, um, into a municipal uh, leadership program, it is called YYC Ask Her. And during last year, before the pandemic happened, I actually had no time to take the program because of my plate was full. And uh, when the pandemic happened, all of a sudden I had all this time on my hands and they reapproached me and asked me if I would be willing to take their pilot pro program. So I had no, you know, no reason to say that I couldn't. And I did go in there with the intention of not running in the municipal, but with the idea of acquiring new skills. 
once I got into that program, I realized how much experience I actually had with the municipal government over my fellow classmates. And it took a long time, but I think those people, those, those mentors, and I was giving mentors from all over the place, mayors, uh, people that work in the federal government, like, you know, there was a lot of people there to help groom me through this. And when I got to the end, I think Calgarians were the ones who, who told me that I could do this. And it was a big push because this was the hardest decision I've ever made in my life. And that includes me leaving to basic training. So I really had to think hard. I didn't want to be the first black woman to run in a municipal election. I wish somebody would have done it before me. But here I am and I sit and I took the I, I just took the leap. And as a soldier, you don't do things halfway. You do them 110 percent and you see them through to the end. So when I, I had to make this decision and it took me about four months, four to five months to figure out what I was gonna do. Clock started to tick down. And finally I had a, you know, a, a somebody who was referred to me through um, the, the elections uh, Calgary, he contacted me and he goes, so what's your answer? And I said, okay, let's do this. So that's where it came to. It was Calgarians that brought me gave me the confidence to turn around and say that I could do this um, because I didn't believe I could. And that's how I ended up here today. Wow. Um, any candidate is out door knocking, talking to their constituents. While COVID-19 has changed the name of the game of how campaigns are run and how you are talking to residents, it is still a uh, name of the game of talking to your residents, finding out the concerns. Usually when candidates get involved in political campaigns like yourself, you, you have an idea of what you're going to hear at the door. Have you been surprised or shocked at some of the concerns that residents are bringing forward to you when you're talking to your neighbors, when you're talking to your constituents in Ward 7? Because I've, uh, I've, my leadership has evolved since 2013 along the municipal government. I did have an initial idea of what the issues were within Ward 7, and that was just from listening, having to listen to the meetings throughout the years. And uh, once I did get out door knocking, honestly, the only thing that was really missing, and people were, are, are, you know, were very confident to tell me about this, is, is they understand that reconciliation is needed with, and I, I believe all Ward 7 people are treaty people. You know, they believe that reconciliation does need you know, need to have an important aspect with the municipal government. It was the, the lack of understanding and willing to admit that they didn't, you know, they did no, no one knows how to do this, put it that way. And for me, I've already done this. So I, you know, I'm here to, to give that, um, those two lens approaches. So I'm going to tell you nothing in the ward has surprised me up to this point because I've been following along with municipal government for so long and I understand where the gaps are. I understand what needs to go forward in the recovery. And that, that has, to, we need that loud voice there, that experience that's going to make things better for Ward 7. So I, I got to ask the follow-up question to that is, what are you hearing at the door? Because I've, sit, I've sat down with multiple candidates from across this uh, city, and I hear the same thing over and over again. X, Y, and Z are the issues that are facing the people of their wards. So what is issue X, Y, and Z for the people of Ward 7. What are they passionate about? What are they talking to you about? I'm going to tell you one of the largest issues that I'm hearing is the engagements that's been happening with the communities, especially along the line of development, crime, parking, because of the development. And these are issues that they are tired of falling on deaf ears. And what I have come to understand working along the municipal government and sitting with the Calgary Police Commission is that there are many gaps and flaws within the, the city of Calgary's in, uh, community engagement process. And they have admitted this too. It could always be better. And these are the issues that we need to start listening to. And that we are missing out on a lot of the voices at that table who are getting frustrated with this current municipal government because they're not being heard. So sometimes, you know, for, for me, it's not even about, you know, door knocking in Ward 7 be, and being scared because I'm Indigenous. They actually want to see that change. And I've seen a lot of acceptance from Ward 7. And I, I really got to thank them for that because, you know, doors are opening to us and they want to have that conversation. And um, we just got to keep, you know, we just got to expand out more and 
you know, get more people out there to, to collect those, those issues. So you mentioned there, fill the gaps. What are the gaps that are missing right now? Is it just the diversity around the city council table? Or what are the gaps that city council needs to fill when it comes to engagement with our communities in Ward 7 and across the city? Well, I also had this conversation with the uh, community associations who I, I, I ultimately respect. And they have respected the, my opinion that uh, even the community associations don't necessarily reflect what the community looks like. And we need to start expanding out on that and creating those programs, but also just making those relationships with our neighbors in the community and making sure that our community people feel like they're a part of that community. So it's not that we're, we're missing, like there's, you're, you're telling me, I'm gonna, I can give you a whole list of gaps. <laughs> Number one is my policy from 2013 and now they're finally talking about it going maybe this was important maybe we should have listened to the, <laughs> the you know to the indigenous committee back in, when we when they tabled it back in 2017 and now that these issues are being retabled you know I'm sitting here and honestly I've gone through a lot of frustration over the years especially um, having my policy largely ignored and it was written for the entire communities of Calgary not just for the indigenous population that's not how how um, Indigenous people think. We think in holistic and we think about everybody that's on our territory because, you know, this is their home too. And we have to be able to share that space in, in a very, you know, safe, safe, common area. And we have to live together. So we need to start figuring out what that community looks like. Within the engagement process, there's a, there's a large number of those voices like my own that are missing from that table. And I, I do understand, especially the uh, vulnerable populations, I've had an engagement with the disability community and their voices are, are missed out, especially coming through the recovery mode of the city. Um, we're gonna, you know, there's a large, we know here in Calgary, we've outgrown our infrastructure and, you know, going through the recovery, the downtown revitalization is a plan that needs to go forward. But no, you know, we need to make sure these buildings are accessible. As a person who has come from the security field, who's patrolled most of those buildings downtown, including our event centers here in the city that are currently here. I've seen very few of them that are accessible for disability people. So these are, you know, there's a lot of gaps there. There are, there are so many, and we have to start being able to be real about them and having a conversation about that. But like even just sitting here today, we've started that process. And what we do today does matter tomorrow. Now I, I'm going to play. I, I I like playing the role of devil's advocate here because I, I like to see where you respond to this line of questioning. You should know, and I will know, and everyone who's listening knows that everyone has their unique perspective, has their unique opinions on how things should be and how things should uh, look like. You are the person who will be elected. You are the person who will be sitting around this uh, the council table, making the decision at the end of the day. How do you balance the needs of what you're hearing at the doors with the needs of what you need to, what you know is to be done for, to move the city forward? Well, I'm going to tell you, I've been doing this already, this kind of, um, this kind of creation, community building for the city. And I'm going to tell you that my, the bottom line is my academics. I'm a very empirical based type person. If people are, have issues, they need to be telling me what these issues are and they you know we need to be you know discussing these in, a, in an open fashion so you know there's there's a lot that that has to go into that when it you know like i said it's it's about empirical base we need to start doing we need a council that can do their homework and to get into those those policies and start figuring out how to implement those policies we've done too much talking to this day we need to start acting on those one of the biggest things that the next council will have to deal with, and you, we've mentioned it here briefly, but I want to talk about it more in depth, is the recovery from COVID-19. COVID-19 has shown uh, a, a gap in society, whether people are getting ahead or whether people are falling behind. And we're seeing more and more people fall behind. They're living paycheck to paycheck. They're one paycheck away from losing their house. They're one paycheck from losing, uh, being homeless. How do you envision your 
role on council of advocating for everyone, advocating for everyone to get a fair shot at this recovery and not being left behind. Because I think there's a lot of people who are looking at this election and thinking to themselves, I want to vote for the person who's going to have my best interest at heart and have my best interest when they're making informed decisions about budgetary issues at the council table. How do you see your role in that? Well, I'm going to tell you, Calgarians are very resilient. We well and re we well recover from this this economic and COVID downturn, and we just got to understand that the, there are al already plans in place to see the city come through the recovery, and we just we need a council that sits there and understands what those policies are that need to come to life. For example, the downtown revitalization. We have to already look, we have to look at what's in our toolbox before we build the community. What do we have at our disposal? Number one, I just, I was given a briefing on the basic income that, it, that, that is supposed to help people that, you know, fell through the cracks of the CERB, you know, that everybody can have a, an opportunity to contribute in, a, in an equal fashion to the economy of Calgary as we recover. So that is something that's already there. But with, with that it comes, you know, for me, a large portion of this is the mental health that's going on right now. Like we're in a, we're in a large, we're in a, 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 an issue here when it comes to the me mental health of Calgary, especially with COVID. The mayor produced a mental health strategy, you know, that was rare in its kind because it brought to the table the right people in order to bring this to life too. That needs to be seen through. So, you know, there are, there are things there that, would, that we need to understand that are already in place that need to go forward. We just have to understand why they are there and we need leaders to make the, the, the take the risks and make leadership decisions and not political decisions because we are in a, a very different situation right now. This, this is not everyday world. So we need leaders to take that risk and to be able to look, look past their political decisions and make decisions based on behalf of Calgarians. And what I do know right now is that the province is, hasn't been here for Calgary. So we need a municipal government and leaders that can step up and voice to the province that what we need for Calgarians. And right now that's not, you know, that's, I, I see, see some stuff coming from the mayor, but when I hear other, you know, politicians and municipal say, well, we should be waiting for the province to give us orders. We can't do that. We, we, you know, the province has already proven they're not here for us. So we need our we need leaders to, to stand the ground and not be political. You know, this has to be about Calgarians and our and their survival going forward. And that's very important. That and I, I love conversations like this, and I appreciate you being so honest and uh, I, I hate to say this word, but blunt, because I think we do need people who will stand up and you know what, not always look at it as I need to be reelected and make the decision on being reelected and making the decisions best for Calgarians. Why do you believe you are the right person to do that? Because we have voices in this election who are saying similar things to you, but not to the full extent that you just said. Why are you the voice to stand up and make this happen? Because I, I want to believe you, but I think we have been so accustomed to politicians saying one thing and then doing another once elected. So how do we believe you when you say you are going to do this if elected on October 18th? First of all, I'm not a politician. I'm a community builder learning how to the skills of navigating the political world. On the other hand, because I've evolved along the political, um, the municipal political, I can play my chess game just as well as they have, and I've learned from the best. So for me, I know how to play the game. I'm experienced. I, I've, I've built some of these policies that are meant to go forward through the recovery. And what we have to do is we have to start listening to our community and what they need. And this is why we, we're, we're going into so many hot, hot topics with the community is because we're not listening. And you know, for me, I, like I said, I'm not, I'm not a politician. I'm actually, first of all, a Canadian Forces soldier. And I, I don't go into things halfway. I go 110% and I see them through. But also, bottom line, I, get, I produced, I, helped, I sat at the table who helped produce the White Goose Flying Report. And that's something that not, nobody in my ward can honestly explain to to the full extent like, like I can, because that policy was here for everybody. 
and we need to start listening to that. City Council now is paying for it because they, 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 they didn't listen to us back in 2017. You know, it was meant for everybody, people with disabilities, people of all colors, you know, every, anybody who calls this Mokkin system or Calgary your home, that policy pertains to you too. So for me, I have that experience. So I, 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 I will be honest, I am a little uh, obtuse when it comes to this because I, I try to do as little research before I come into these interviews because I want to learn from you. I basically want to be the resident at the doorstep who's learning from the candidate who's pitching them. So for those who don't know, what is the White Goose Flying Report? Well, back when the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, was being established nationally, and um, they were bringing together all the residential school sub survivors. What was produced out of the, those national engagements with residential school survivors? What was, it was called the Tr uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission Report. And it, it, the, those were recommendations and calls to action that were, you know, that were meant to be implemented at a very high level in order to bring reconciliation and understanding with all Canadians. Now, at that time, the city council, they, um, they appointed our committee, which was the Calgary Aboriginal Urban Affairs Committee, with the task of producing a local version of that report so we can actually implement it here for all Calgarians. Now, going through that process of, of producing the White Goose Flying Report, because I'm a product of what systemic racism is and the policy of assimilation under the Indian Act of Canada, my grandparents, like I said, are residential school. My parents are 60 scoop. I'm federal Indian day school. So for someone to tell me that systemic racism doesn't exist is, is very personal to me because I am the product of it. So, you know, what I was there to do is I was there to have my traumas analyzed and, and put down on a piece of paper for all Calgarians. And it took them some time to get me to that table because I wanted to know why I was doing it and if it was going to have a purpose in the future. And because I'm a soldier, it had to be for everybody. So that was, the, that was my, those were my traumas put into that policy and it was meant for everybody. And for it to be ignored up to this point has been very um, difficult, but I do see that things are moving along and that you know those calls to action are starting to be, they're starting to filter out. And we need to see that work go forward if we're going to actually live in this valley together. Um, I, I, I usually leave this off until the end of the interview, but I'm going to ask it anyway, because it is a, a poignant question. Would you like to see that full policy implemented, the white goose flying policy framework implemented if elected or if you not, even if you're not elected in the next term? Well, I'm going to tell you, I've been working with that policy ever since it was tabled. I brought it to the Calgary Police Commission. I've brought it to the organizations I work frontline with. And, you know, it, it is there for every, it's a living document. And it's something I put my heart into. So whether or not I end up in municipal government, that's still going to be my, my blood, sweat and tears that I know was meant for all Calgarians. And my voice is going to be largely behind that, regardless. Of, uh, you know, if municipal is still going to ignore it up to, you know, you know, up to that point, I have to get this policy. I, this is the word I gave to those ladies and those folks sitting with me on that committee who are also probably feeling, you know, the, the sadness of, of waiting for so long for this reconciliation to come to Calgary. So I have to stand beside it. Like I said, I'm not a politician, I'm a soldier. And that's, that's a policy I carry close to me. And it's going to be with me for the rest of my life. Now, one of the other areas that you've talked about a few times during our interview so far is the downtown revitalization. Ward 7 is relatively the center of the city. It is the uh, heart of the downtown core is in Ward 7. So this is a area and an issue that is probably heard a lot when you're canvassing or talking to your neighbors. I, I got to ask... How do we revitalize the downtown core? Because we people outside of uh, Ward Seven who are on in the northeast, the southeast, who don't live close to downtown, they don't see it as an issue. 
why is it such an important thing to revitalize that downtown downtown core? Well, I'm going to tell you, the downtown core is 14% of the entire city's income. And currently, that is not even being half fulfilled because you look at how many em empty buildings are downtown. And all these single family homes, people that own property, small businesses, who's picking up that expense? We need to care about our downtown revitalization if, if we're going to start alleviating that with our residents in Ward 7. So this is a lot of money. I want to also ask, because how do I put this correctly? Businesses have left uh, Calgary. Um, every business is changing right now due to COVID-19. How do we attract businesses back to fill those empty vacant buildings downtown? Or do we need to start looking at alternative methods to use for those vacant buildings downtown? What is your solution to fix the downtown core vacancy issues to start bringing in some of that income that we are losing every year right now? Well, we need to, we have what in Ward 7, we have the University of Calgary, have the post-secondary. And uh, honestly, when I graduated out, um, I graduated out to this economic downturn and most of my classmates left and they're serving other districts and other cities with their talents. So we need to start retaining our own talent here but also attracting other talent. And that is, includes making our city, you know, attractable, affordable for these students to want to come here and stay and raise their families. But you also look at what's already in the toolbox and ready to go. And one of the, one of the, um, the projects I, I actually I'm familiar with is through Calgary Economic Development. And they have funds there to see the technology come to life. And they've, they've managed to allocate funds into the buildings like the Odd Fellows building where they have a state campus there that is producing talent that's meant to be for, for Calgary. So we need to start investing in what is already there and set to move forward. And we already have the, that, those the projects in place. We just need to see them through. And you know we need to keep track. Calgary is a world-class city. We deserve a world-class economy. And we are, you know, we are, we have a large talent pool here especially you know, with, that, with the folks that, that lost out on the oil and gas industry, we need to provide them with retraining. And these programs that SATE are providing are real examples of what we need to focus on to see forward. So it's very important to, to invest in our areas, you know, our talent, our film industry. You know, if you have a look at their, uh, their, their report to the community that just came out this year, they have some amazing projects that are aimed at the technology world, artificial intelligence, so these are the avenues we need to start exploring and starting to attract it, you know, our students that are out there looking for these kind of jobs. So yes, we need to, we need to make our, it, it leads down to you know, making our city attractable and wanting for them to come. I, I, I love people, guests like you who make my job so much easier in the segues into different areas of conversation, because the next area I want to talk about is that attraction of residents, but also retention of residents, because uh, we talked about it briefly there for a second, but students are leaving because they want to go to Vancouver or Toronto, and then they stay in Vancouver and Toronto. Few, like yourself, move back here to Calgary. How do we retain our current students so that way they do have that uh, economic hope of an actual livable house, uh, being able to uh, live and work and play in this community, but also attract new residents to come here and set up their livelihoods here in the city of Calgary? Well, it, it does come down to making the city affordable to live in. And right now there are projects downtown looking at those empty buildings downtown to make them affordable places to live. So, you know, that, that includes making our city attractable. The downtown revitalization is part of that. Let's attract these people into our city so they wanna stay and raise their families. But the small businesses that are that are coming up, uh, what I do know about the the business sector, and I've had many of my personal friends go through this. There's a lot of red tape that a small business per you know uh, person entrepreneur has to go through in order to get the business license, jump through the red tape, get all their their numbers, 
you know, we, we should be looking at a central location to actually make this happen. And I believe Calgary Economic Development and um, the Chamber of Commerce are involved with, with projects like that. So we need to focus on, on making a central area for these businesses to come and to do their business, business to business, business to consumer, you know, business to industry, one stop place for this and making it easier. Because once we make the system easier for, for, for business people to want to be here, they will come. You know, we have to start opening up and seeing where these opportunities are, but also what we already have here that is meant to expand past into the future to, to, to actually alleviate stuff like this. And it's there. We just need to support it as municipal leaders. You are talking my language as a business owner who just opened up a business in Calgary. I know exactly what you're talking about, how, how many hoops you had to jump through and how many different organizations you had to talk to. So I appreciate you saying that. Um, I, I, I do want to go uh, move on to a subject that you've mentioned a few times, and I want to uh, get your opinion on this. And this is around your time on the uh, police commission but also there has been in the last year and a half, I think you know which, which where I'm going with this question by the look on your face, there have <laughs> been people in the city who feel as though the police service needs to be defunded because they are getting too much money as, right now. In your own words, what is your opinion on the defund the police uh, uh, I, want, I don't want to say protest, but uh, the defund the police narrative, but also how the Calgary Police Service is helping the people of Calgary in your own words. Okay, first of all, I'm going to tell you, I'm very thankful to the defund to fund movement and to the Black Lives Matters movement, because they brought front and center an issue that the Indigenous people of Canada have been trying to centralize for for. For, for generations. And, you know, finally, we have it front and center. So with that being said, I did it, I did, we did do an engagement with the uh, professional uh, panel that came into City Hall during the anti-racism uh, uh, forum that they had. And being able to sit down and engage with them on that level where we're finally trying to create real solutions was, you know, it was, it was a very huge learning experience for me. But on the other hand, it, it, you know, from listening to the community, we should be, and, and from my experience as a frontline soldier, when I was 19, I was not equipped to be handling mental health issues at that point as a, as a fresh new frontline person. You know, we should be actually putting the responsibility on to the organizations who are equipped to handle that, like mental health. And, you know, domestic violence is another one. And while policing can remain policing. On the other hand, the other, the other lens that I bring into this picture is that, you know, we have to start understanding what's are already here and what's been here since before time. And before anything came here, the indigenous people had structures, they had organizations, they had government, they had police. So, you know, we have to also consider what's already here and we can't, you know, we have to start acknowledge, you know, acknowledging those, those knowledge keepers that hold those positions here and their ceremonies are attached to this land. No one has talked to them yet based on this. I have, so has my CPS. So, you know, in the work that the CPS has engaged with, with those traditional knowledge keepers, I'm very proud of them. And I'm very proud to be a part of that, that relationship building with that. We need to see that further. So I, I believe in innovation. I believe in ideas. I believe in things to make it get better. But no one has questioned my traditional knowledge keepers out of this movement about what the, how they feel about defund. One of the areas that, uh, and yet again, uh, I, for those who are not uh, watching these episodes, I'm a white male. I'm a gay white male in northern, uh, northeastern Calgary. Um, I, I am pretty sure everyone has noticed that. My name is Chris Brown. I'm not the rapper. I am the white Chris Brown. <laughs> I, I want to ask the question because I have family members who are black and they feel they are systematically targeted 
they are all people are always looking over their shoulder because they are black. Um, there is a case where a police officer pulled over my nephew who said, hey, why are you driving this car? It looks out of your price range. I, I got to ask the question because you used the word a few minutes ago, a few, a few moments ago, and I want to ask the question. I want to get your opinion on this. And I'm not, and the only reason I'm asking you this is because uh, you're on the police commission and you, you've opened the, opened the box here. Is the Calgary Police Service systematically racist when it comes to our Indigenous and Black people of Calgary? Well, I'm going to tell you, during the time when the anti-racism forums were going on, we, uh, we were having close, like we were having our meetings with CPS and uh, with the union who honestly, we uh, never really had good relations with, like it, the relations were very strained at that point between um, the union and the commission. And it, it was like that right from before I came. So, you know, during that time when all the anti-racism was going on, um, we actually met with the, uh, you know, with the union and the Calgary Police Service, and we wanted to know what the solution was going to be. And, it, you know, you could see, you can find in City Hall this, this statement that we put out. And it was, it was all three organizations, and this was another historical event that's never happened because all three organizations were at odds up until that point. And we all agreed that it is about systemic racism. It's not about racist people. It's the system. If a, a person can still part, a really good person can still participate in that, that system, even though they're not racist. It's about the system that it's created on. It's not about individual people. And that's what everybody has to understand. I appreciate your honesty and your candor about that. And I apologize for if I sprung that upon you. I just wanted, it, and this is the great thing about this show that I never know where the conversation is going to go. And I appreciate your honesty. And I love when politicians and candidates for elected office are honest and have the ability to answer the questions that may sometimes may be uncomfortable, but sometimes need to be asked. So thank you. Um, I want to turn now because I'm just cautious of time. We're at the about 35 minute mark and I want to make sure that we get everything in. Um, you are running for Ward 7 City Council. Uh, hypothetically on October 18th, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a magic ball out here and say, you are not going to be elected with 100% of the vote because there are other people running against you. How will you be the councillor for everyone and not just the people who vote for you? Well, I'm, I've already started this process and we've been really acknowledged. Our campaign has been really acknowledged for this. It doesn't matter about my competitors. It's about building relationships. And I've reached out and done engagements with my fellow uh, Ward 7 uh, candidates. And I've reached out to other wards such as Angela McIntyre from Ward 4 so I can get an understanding of what her values are. For me, it's not about the individual that's sitting in city council. It's, it's can they take our values as a community to that level? And for me, that is why I've been making these relationships is because I wanna know what other people's values are and how I, mine fit into theirs. So we need to, as candidates, we shouldn't be you know, disrespecting each other, calling each other down, reaching out to, find dirt on one another. Because that's honestly, the, the, there's seven teachings in the, in, the, in the Treaty 7 Indigenous community. And one of them is have respect. Another one is have humility. And those are things that we need to start bringing back to municipal government are those seven teachings. Are, are, we call them the grandfather teachings because they are a universal way of, for humans to actually get along with each other and we, we, we've, so, we've sort of forgotten that even my own community, my own indigenous community, we're, we have a lot of lateral violence. We, we, we've, we're starting to forget those teachings because we're not listening to the traditional knowledge keepers here. So, you know, we need to start bringing back universal teachings such as that in order to have respect for each other. I appreciate that. And I, I love the word respect because I find that uh, when I talk to residents across the city, this council and the council that is currently there doesn't seem like it has respect when they're infighting 
when they're yelling at each other and when they're going out to the news media and bashing each other on a left, right, and center basis. So I appreciate that you're willing to bring respect to the city council. So thank you for that. Uh, on the lines of October 18th, October 18th, you are elected. You are now the councillor designate for Ward 7. On October 19th, you wake up. What is priority number one for you? Get some rest. <laughs> <laughs> you were the first candidate to say that. Thank you. Thank you for being honest. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, you know, this has been a very long road on this campaign trail. And I have a lot of very neglected friends and family members right now. <laughs> I think I need to just center myself and be ready to walk into this role in a very honorable manner that I, I've described that I, I, I do have value in. So how is that going to be? Like I said, it's about humility for me. But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to sleep for about 16 hours. <laughs> yeah. Your campaign team will pick up all the signs, right? You'll, you'll be sleeping. <laughs> campaign team's going to do all the cleanup. <laughs> I love your honesty. Oh, Marilyn, I love you. Um, I want to, uh, my last question, and this is the big one. Um, Talk to the people of Ward 7. We have a roughly, a, we have a large uh, population or love, large uh, listenership here in the city of Calgary. I don't know exactly where they are, but for those who are listening in Ward 7, I'm going to ask you this poignant question. Why should you be the next city councillor for Ward 7? Whenever you're ready, take it away. Well, I'm going to tell you, you know, my road with the municipal government has been a long one. And sometimes it's been tiresome. Sometimes it's been heartbreaking. Sometimes it's been exciting. I've had my, my ups and downs through this, through this uh, process, but I've never left that table. I've sat at that table 110% with my voice, even though in the beginning, no one wanted to hear things like TRC or you know, equality or, you know, those were issues that were not there when I actually showed up to the table. So I am willing to see it through and fight through, not only with my experience, but with, with the, you know, with the other worldview I have, which is my traditional teachings, and I bring those to the table. So I have a, I have a two lens view of this municipal government, and they are very thorough, and I use my education and my experience with the city to bring those two worlds together in very dramatic ways. If, you know, you, if anybody would read the uh, report from the, the Calgary P Police Commission on, on the, all the anti-racism work that we've done over the year, they, they will understand why I'm so drained in doing that work, but I need to see it forward. See, I, I, you know, I'm a soldier, I'm not a politician. I'm, I'm a leader and I'm one here, I'm one that's willing to take a risk, not based on political choice, but because Calgarians need it, especially the people of Ward 7. I was not going to ask this question, but I, I'm going to anyway, because it's my show and I get to ask the questions. What would it mean to you on October 19th, if you were the first elected Blackfoot woman for the city of Calgary? I think for me, it just means a huge pile of work, but I think what it means for everybody else is that this can, this is possible. Because a year ago, I didn't believe that this was, a, this, this was possible. So, you know, when I wake up on October 19th, I want people to understand that, there, you know, it is possible to have an Indigenous leadership that represents all, who has the heart to actually fight for people of all colours and all nationalities at a very high level and make action happen. I am not a talker, I'm an action person. And that's where I base my, my you know, a, a lot of the issues that, I, that I've engaged with, especially in the community. I work frontline. I've worked in a high government. I've been all, through all avenues of Calgary. And right now it is to me, it is about community. So I need the youth to see that I'm there and to, you know, like I, that's why I said, I didn't want to be the first in, uh, Blackfoot woman to do this. I wish it already happened but I'm willing to take that role and to, to walk it with honor. 
if other if this is going to encourage other other people to, to do this that are you know minority women that are indigenous wherever black do it it's possible and that's the that's the message i'm going to bring while we have sat here for the last 40 minutes roughly 40 minutes i have tried to ask you all the questions that have come to the top of my head there is probably someone yelling at their car stereo who's listening to this, who's yelling at the YouTube channel, who's watching this saying, why didn't you ask her this? How can people ask you questions about your campaign? How can people ask you questions about uh, where you stand on issues? How can people reach out to you? Well, right now we, we did make our campaign. If you jump on my website, www.marilynward7.ca, you can see that a, a large portion of our uh, campaign is actual is, is virtual, and we we have the capabilities of doing coffee chats, and you can sign up through that on our website. And I have done one-on-one -on -one engagements with you know with people who just want to sit down and have a conversation about something that matters to them. So we're not only doing it through door knocking yet; we're we're doing it through virtual. So you know we're we have a team there that looks after all of our. Um, our emails and anything pressing that they can that needs to go directly to me, I ha I handle that personally. So I'm a very approachable human being, and I I it, my priority is to listen to citizens. And I've opened up all avenues, you know, virtual and in public, to actually come and meet me and engage with me and ask me questions. Actually, this this weekend we're going to be at the uh, Chinese Lantern Festival. And um, we got a table there and we're gonna be saying hi to Chinatown residents and handing out signs and pamphlets. So, you know, we are always in the community. I tend to really engage with events and I've always been like that um, even in my day job and what I do with the arts, I'm always out there and I'm very approachable. I, I, I would love, I love people to come up and have conversations with me. These are things that matter to me too. Um, for my listeners and to my viewers, the links to Marilyn's website, Instagram, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Twitter and Facebook are in the show notes. So go below, check it out. I highly recommend you get educated in this election. And uh, for those who have heard me say this over and over again, I'm going to say it one more time for the people who didn't hear in the back of the room. This election is about the future of our city. If you do not vote, I do not want to see you on social media complaining. So get out, get educated, learn about the candidates in your awards and the mayor and the city and the school board and vote for the person who is going to represent your morals and your values correctly. At the end of the day, if you do not vote, you do not have a voice. So please get out and vote. Marilyn, I want to uh, thank you for the honor and privilege of sitting down and talking today. It has been an honor and I feel like we need more people like you in, in elected positions. So I wish you all the best on October 18th. Marilyn, greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much, Chris, for taking the time to listen to me and to hear my aspect on you know, a lot of things. And I, I, I welcome more questions from the community as we move along.